friends and welcome to Poland. We're in the capital city, Warsaw, a place that survived countless eras of human devastation. Battles, sieges, empires come and gone, revolutions, socialism, and a couple of world wars too. It's a resilient city with historical scars that are impossible to ignore. The place we're standing in right now is a great example, a 20th century reconstruction of the original Middle Ages town that was flattened along with most of the rest of the city during World War II. The city planner is using paintings from that era to ensure it looked the same. A modern adaptation of something of significant cultural importance, not too dissimilar from the story we're about to tell you. The Witcher series turns 10 years old this month, which gave us a wonderful excuse to fly across the world to talk to the various people behind the design of each game. We spent a week here in Warsaw interviewing developers, spending time with the team, and learning about the place that brought these stories to life. In fact, it's impossible to talk about The Witcher without taking into account the cultural landscape that brought it about. This is a uniquely Slavic game, both in its lore and the way in which it was designed. And the company that created it is uniquely Polish, born out of decades of bleak socialist rule. So before we talk about Novigrad, Neckers and Noon rates, we must first tell the story of Sede Projekt. Our series on The Witcher starts decades before a single line of code is ever written in a place called the Polish People's Republic. You didn't have your passport at home. You were not allowed to have it. So every single time you wanted to go abroad, you had to go to the passport office and then there was an interview. Every single time you wanted to go uh, abroad, even for a few days, it was like, why are you going? But so uh, your family left and so, hmm, sorry, we well, cannot grant you the passport uh, um, on the risk of you fleeing the country. They had the greatest place on earth, you know. So there were two kinds of leaving Poland. So you could leave to the friendly bloc countries. Right. Uh, so like the Eastern countries, like the Eastern Germany, Deutsche um, Demokratische Republik DDR, Czech Republic, Slovakia. That, that was fairly easy and you were getting a special passport for that. Right. And I remember, even at a certain point, they allowed you to have this passport for these countries at home. It, it was unbelievable. Uh, but then going to the Western world was, was uh, first of all, hard to get a passport. But even if you had one, it was super expensive because you were earning like, you know, a, a tiny fraction of five, the average income was 5% or 10% what was in the West. So not many people were able to afford it. Marcin Iwinski, the co-founder of Sede Project, grew up behind what we in the West call the Iron Curtain. When the Warsaw Pact was signed in 1955, Europe was effectively split in half politically, the capitalist West and the socialist East. Marcin grew up in Warsaw, about as close to the West as you could be. His parents did their best to protect him from the reality of the world he grew up in. His father, a documentarian, would take work in the West a few months of the year to earn money to bring back home. Sort of the, the socialists started to sort of uh, loosening the, the grip. So first you were going, the first trips were obviously Czechoslovakia, Eastern Germany, Hungary. Uh, and then my first real like a Western trip, I went to Sweden. And that was the first time I, I boarded a plane and, and I wasn't a plane. It was incredible because I still remember I was early in my teens, I don't know, 11, 12 years old. So I had a stewardess sort of um, walking me through. I was a kiddo and I boarded the plane. I arrived in Stockholm and then my parents, parents picked me up. And the first moment we stopped at a supermarket and it's a supermarket, <laughs> what's that? And you know, the jaw is dropping. That's an abundance of everything. Like, yeah. I still remember the, the, the crates of 7up. And I was like, you know, or like, or like the toys department, right. simple things like that. So the po Poland had none of that, like zero. You had places to buy some imported stuff. It was super expensive. You were normally never buying them. And suddenly you go to the, to the West and you see they have everything. Why don't we have it? So, yeah. yeah. For me, this period of time was never like really painful. The, the difference, for example, when I'm when I'm watching the old Polish comedies from these from these times or, or movies, for me it's funny. For my parents, it's not funny at all. Uh, so two different realities.
presumably then things that were brought in from the West, was it more colorful or something? Yeah, oh, people, totally, yeah. totally. Like, uh, it's actually a very good point because for me, the, the predominant color of, not even Poland, Warsaw, gray. Right. So socialism for me is gray. Mm -hmm. And then after several years, I went for the first uh, time to Moscow and I said, wow, that's where the color comes from. Mm -hmm. That's gray, everything here is gray, you know? So, and, and then the West started to bring colors, variety. I still remember they opened the first Burger King right next to my high school. Right. It's like, oh, okay, I'm a vegetarian since 25 years, by the way. <laughs> but anyway, back in the day I wasn't. <laughs> so we were queuing four to five hours mm. to get into the Burger King. And it was like a, like a temple of, of, the, of the Western you know, symbols. Like, uh, I think it sounds very, very high level, but that's what it was for us. Mm. We could actually taste the West. Things from the West carried a cultural weight once they made it across the border. So for somebody who was interested in games, few things were more wondrous than the computers that ran them. There was the, uh, the Atari, I think 65XE, with the cassette player and the cartridges. That, that was popular because uh, someone started importing them here. Uh, but they were still fairly expensive. And then the Commodore 64. Right. And then high school, it was already started opening up. So it was more... I think then, then, of course, the technology was progressing. So PCs were still kind of like the Hercules and the EGA card. So that wasn't really very attractive, but then there was Amiga. And right. Amiga here in Poland was, was huge. And actually from Spectrum, I moved directly to Amiga. And it was like, I don't know, from from Famitsu moving to probably PS4. Right, uh, do you have 500 or 600? Uh, I had the 500, that was, that was the best one. And also all of these systems incredibly easy to copy games for. Of course, that's that's a that's a very very important thing because initially it was small, so it was really like a hobbyist thing. Uh, the computer market here in Warsaw and every single big city, geeks and hobbies exchanging things they have. But then it started growing into business. So when more people got Amigas, uh, and actually you know, then some people were bringing these Amigas and selling them here, going every week to Berlin, buying them and reselling them uh, here with a profit then it started growing so the sort of the it was still kind of small for like the, looking at the size of the market but then in my class i don't know out of 30 i don't know maybe maybe eight kids had computers so it started growing players would flock to computer markets to get games and magazines like miniature conventions every weekend with friends and strangers exchanging games making copies on cassette tapes and discussing rumors about the games that were coming out the mysticism of these analog talismans comes across when Marcin tells me about these days in fact because the data was based on tapes some polish radio stations would even broadcast games over the airwaves for players to copy so they were they were like hey tune in at um, 5, 10 p.m. and then uh, start recording. And then it was like, doo -doo, doo -doo, and, then, <laughs> and then people were just recording and then replaying them to the, the, to the computers. We had all these Grundigs and are uh, using TDK tapes and then, you know, recording and then replaying and we're like, wow, it's so cool. And then, you know, some people had collections which were like couple thousand tapes. Right. Yeah, couple thousand tapes all with games. The Polish video game community was ravenous for new games, trading them at markets, copying them from their friends, even recording them off the radio for damn sake. But to get games into that ecosystem, first of all, you had to get them into the country. And that's where Marcin found his angle. You know, I wasn't a coder. I wasn't like a music composer. Uh, I wasn't an, an art guy. So the only thing I could do would be probably a swapper, yeah? There was the magazine called Your Sinclair uh, about Spectrum and they were reviewing games. At the end, there was, there was a section with, with, with the ads, like the, the tiny ads. People were advertising like, hey, if you want to swap games, I don't know, send me a list. And it was all happening by mail, so you have to go to the post office, uh, post a letter, then they were writing you back. Yeah. How crazy it sounds today, a letter, uh, uh, writing something on paper. It's like an email that takes a week. Yeah. Yeah. No, actually two. <laughs> <laughs> The guy was from Greece. I wrote him that, hey, I'm marching and uh, I would like to swap games. <laughs> the problem is that I don't have any new ones. If that's okay, I'll be sending you every single time two cassette tapes. One you will keep for yourself and the other one you will record whatever new stuff you have and send it back to me. And then I thought he will not write me back. And then one day a tape arrives with games that uh, um, nobody has in Poland. Right. And then I'm bringing them 
to the computer market and I'm the man. <laughs> yeah, I'm the king of the hill. Right. Huh? How cool is that? And that's how my swapping career started. Technology evolved and so too did the swappers. Marcin got his hand on a modem and began logging onto BBS systems and pulling games off the internet. Suddenly his stand at the market had the latest games every single week. And what's most important about this is that none of it, the swapping, downloading, copying off the radio, was technically illegal. Copyright law was a worry for the West, but in socialist Poland, it simply didn't exist. There was no copyright law in Poland. Even if there would be one back in the day, people wouldn't buy software because they were not able to afford it. The legal market was super tiny. Uh, there were already some companies working, but as we were emerging out of socialism, you know, they wanted to civilize the world part by part, piece by piece. And at a certain moment, they, in 94, actually, that they, they established the corporate law. That's actually when we started to the break. At a certain point, one of, my, one of my friends from the scene said, wow, I just got a CD-ROM, and it's so cool, and I'm playing Seven Gas, Mad Dog McCree, and, and I really got a, a lot of my savings, and I bought one of the first CD-ROMs in Poland. And then I got these games. Uh, he put me in touch with a, a wholesaler uh, somewhere in, I think, Indiana. They were not specializing in games per se. They had a very huge offer of triple X stuff, but we were not tempted. Uh, we <laughs> we stick to <laughs> so whenever we get getting a, a, a catalog. Big part of it was, you know, crazy Pamela's and, and all that stuff. But there was seventh guest. You, you could you could be suspicious about the name of Mad Dog McCree could also, but actually you could take any gaming name, Diablo. Hmm? Yeah. You know? right, yeah. Marcin's school friend Michał Kaczynski was selling on the market that he was importing for. Together, they were able to take advantage of the expanding market for compact discs. CD-ROMs were a huge disruptor for the games market. While even in Poland there were manufacturing plants spitting out floppy discs, CD-ROMs were incredibly expensive to create. Single-speed burners ranged in the thousands, while an individual CD-ROM in Poland could cost a week's wages. It simply cost too much and took too long to make copies. But but at the same time, the amount of data that they could hold made them incredibly valuable to consumers. Encarta Encyclopedia may seem like an expensive way of using Wikipedia today, but back then it was effectively replacing entire shelves of books. For games, this meant far more data. Music, voiceovers, richer textures, FMV video. Marcin and Michał started importing American Laserdiscs and packaging them with Polish boxes and Polish manuals. But the team wanted to do more with localization, even if their peers in the market disagreed. You see, at the time, the accepted market knowledge was that there wasn't a market for localized games in Poland. Gaming was a niche market there, and so localized games were even more niche. But what Sede Projekt reckoned was that that was actually the wrong way around. The reason they thought games were niche was that so few of them were available in Polish. Especially in the 90s, where the country had only just opened up to the West and levels of English speaking were far less than they are today. To test this theory, they needed a guinea pig. So, they started with a kid's game. One of the first titles we localized, fully localized, was Ace Ventura. And we actually found a guy who helped us to localize it. Uh, he did a bloody good job. Wow. Uh, so What's the Polish for all righty then? Uh, <laughs> I don't remember actually. <laughs> Ace Ventura was the first one and actually there were some songs. So we recorded the songs in the studio and it was a blast. People loved it. Lower price point, like a typical mass market proposition. And you know, also the first game. So. Uh, Instead of hundreds, we started selling small thousands. Localization was working. Polish players were willing to pay to have games in their native language. But what Marcin would learn is that they were actually solving a cost problem for the publishers too. Back then, games were translated into other languages, but usually at a high cost to the publishers. Developers would take on the work themselves and usually charge high Western rates to translate games into French, German, Spanish, and other common European languages. But languages like Polish were considered exactly exotic and charged even more. So translating them made little sense, considering the size of the market. The other issue with creating a Polish language option for these games was the risk that these Polish versions of the game would flood back into Western Europe. 
The cost of living in Poland was but a fraction of that in the West, so games had to be much, much cheaper. If they'd made multilingual versions of the game, the publisher would risk cheap Polish copies of the game arriving in Germany and beyond. But if Sede Projekt were able to create a purely Polish version of the game, this would never happen. Few people in the West spoke Polish either. The guys had their business model. After Ace, they struck a deal with MGM to localize the Pink Panther, and it wasn't long before they were setting their sights on bigger fish. While established Polish distributors were concerned with big companies like EA, said the project managed to strike a deal with Interplay. Their first few deals weren't great, they ended up sitting on a stockpile of Dungeon Keeper 2 they couldn't shift, but it started a conversation which would eventually lead them to securing a publishing deal for Baldur's Gate. 3,000 units, with all the risk on Sede Projekt's shoulders. They needed to make this work. Kryje w swoim wnętrzu najpełniejszą i chyba największą kolekcję pism w Ferunie. First, we took famous Polish actors for the main characters, for, for the na narrator and then the NPCs. And, and there are still like the, the iconic voices. We prepared a huge, beautifully looking box. There were the five CDs. Uh, we um, uh, struck a deal with, with a local D&D book publisher, so we actually added there a D&D, totally not related to Baldur's Gate, but it didn't matter because the value was there. It was, it was the flavor, and then we added a, a, a map, a true co collector's edition. Just to put it into perspective, before we signed the deal, we were shitting our pants with Nihal that these 3,000 units can bankrupt us. Because if we'll fail, you know, we're done. We're investing a lot of money in it. And maybe we'll not say 3,000 or 1,000, maybe the market. Of course, you have these doubts, you have these fears. By the time you're going to the market, we have fixed orders for 18,000 units. Oh my God. Yes. So like, that's, that's the proportion. And before, the best game that we were selling was maybe 1,000, maybe 2,000. And to put it into perspective, there's not even one retail chain in Poland back in the day. So it's all wholesalers, guys dealing on these computer markets, mom and pop stores. Our warehouse, where, where our office is, our warehouse, our room, <laughs> was able to, to, to take 5,000 units maybe. Oh my God. Maybe eight, if we put it all around the corridors and desks and shit. <laughs> so we actually took a separate warehouse. Right. There was a queue of these wholesalers uh, early in the morning, and they actually, there was a fist fight in front of the warehouse who will get the stock first. We sold the whole 8,000 units. Within the first year, we sold 50,000 units. That's what happened. That's it's the making of a company. That's yeah. Why should I buy something when I have it for free? Yeah. Software is free, hardware is what you pay for. And suddenly you have this collector's piece with the cultural seat of quality. And of course, the first and foremost, most important thing, the game was great. Yeah. <laughs> it, <laughs> helped, it helps that it was about, also yeah, Baldur's Gate. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah sorry. <laughs> sorry, I should, I should have mentioned that at the very beginning because like, hey, we created it and Baldur's Gate was crap. I didn't like to don't play, man. Uh, no, no, the game was amazing. So people couldn't wait to play it, but it was for them. It was in their local language and uh, actors signed up for it. The, the value of the package was great. So it was amazing to have it on your shelf. And this was sort of beating the pirates to the punch because of, of course they copied it a few uh, days later. They had all our games copied 24 to 44 uh, eight would hours you go later. Down there? Yeah, of course we would. And they had they, they had this we, we had this sort of seal of quality, the professional Polish version by the Project. They were putting on every goddamn game, oh, whether we, it was our stolen version or not. They were actually even localizing themselves quite often with really badly uh, bad Polish, like with a Ukrainian accent recorded in the kitchen. Pietia, Pietia, Prichody! Mom, I'm recording. <laughs> and then they came and la la la, you know. You, you had stuff like that, you know? And I think it's, it, it's pretty much all around the world. Uh, right now, not buying, but downloading from torrents. But if there is a game you deeply care about, you don't pirate it. Yeah. Said that project understood the Polish market more than anyone, but over the next few years, as they'd helped to legitimize it, publishers were trying to get more and more involved. Marcin knew that the long-term health of the company required that they diversify. They had never made a game, but the money being brought in from their distribution wing put them in the unique position where they had the capital to self-fund a game if they wanted to. And then we went to um, E3 and it was the first and only time when, when we visited Interplay in Irvine, they invited us over. That's amazing. It was just, you know, blown away. Like, like, like the kids in a, in, a, in, a, in a chocolate factory. 
We saw the Baldur's Gate uh, Dark Alliance because that was the first presentation. And at the end of the presentation, they tell us that it's just a console title. It was like PlayStation 2, I believe. Um, and the market here, 90, 95% PC, console still super early. And I really started thinking, hey, could we make a PC version? Or no, can we convince them to make a PC version? Yes, no. So at the end of the day, during the dinner, we approached our Interplay contacts from Interplay Europe and said, hey guys, you know, why don't you do a PC version? So like, hey, we have no resource for that. Why don't you do it? We're like, hmm, okay, let's, let's think about it. So like a few weeks later, we flew over to London to talk to them. They gave us the PS2 dev kit and we smuggled it back to Poland in our carry-ons. So we already had the dev kit. Uh, we had the source code. And so uh, we found a guy that was... Uh, PS2 that, dev kit was pretty big. It, oh, yeah, it was huge. I, I actually was, I was, I, I was actually afraid that the customs would control us. We had no papers for it. Right. The custom was kind of harsh back in the day. The guys returned from Poland with their PlayStation 2 development kit and got in touch with Sebastian Zelinski, the creator of the Mortar engine, to see about creating a port. But soon after, news about Interplay went sour. Their UK contacts sent them over a contract but advised them not to sign it as the company looked like it was folding. And sure enough, the inevitable happened. The deal was off and the guys were left with a dev kit. But the seed had been planted. For years they had just been middlemen. Now was the time for them to take the leap into games development. When Sede Project initially went down the road to try and create their own video game, somebody on the team suggested that before they create their own IP, maybe they should check in to see if they could get the license for a particularly popular set of fantasy novels. Now, these novels were basically unknown to anyone living outside of Poland, but to Marcin and his generation, it was one of the most important pieces of literature in their life. But we really signed the Polish Lord of the Rings and we couldn't believe that. I still remember because I was, during my high school times and early university, I was totally into science fiction and fantasy. Sapkowski comes with the first story, it's about the Striga, and I read it in, in the Science Fiction Monthly, and then he publishes books, and you know, it's, it's a cult, it's a cult thing. For, for my generation, it's, it's totally the best thing we've, we've ever read. Actually, we never really thought about it as a monetary value, so like, hey, we signed it for this amount of money, or it, it was never like a part of our calculation. We had a chance to, to build a game on something we, we were totally passionate about, and, and that was the most important, important part. So like, obviously, if the price tag would be so high that we uh, wouldn't be able to afford it, we just wouldn't sign it, but it was... It, it, it was really totally not, 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 not a commercial calculation. And then, you know, we spent five years to deliver the first game. So you can say, yeah, because we were very naive by, by signing it and, and thinking that we'll deliver a game on it. And we were, actually. <laughs> The first year of development was difficult. They worked on a tech demo and flew to 10 meetings all around Europe to try and secure a publisher. Of those 10, only two replied, and both told them they should maybe try a little harder. They knew they needed to work on the engine, but couldn't come to an agreement on the direction of the technology with Zielinski and his team in the city of Wust. So Marcin decided to take production in-house under the name Sede Project Red. They offered jobs in Warsaw to the other members of that team. They all agreed. One of them was a graphic designer called Adam, who's now head of the studio. We always wanted to combine the story with the open world. And in The Witcher 1, we wanted to, to do this. And the second uh, level is like uh, the most open level uh, in, in the game. Uh, this is the di direction that we wanted to, to, to go, to follow. Technology uh, didn't allow us to, to do it but we always wanted to combine these two things. It's like um, magical thinking, very optimistic th thinking, but The Witcher 1 established this direction. Said their project had big ideas about the game they wanted to create, but they needed an engine. So at the next E3, they approached their friends at Bioware about licensing the Neverwinter Nights engine. To their surprise, Bioware agreed, and so the team went on to work on The Witcher. A year later, before the following E3, they flew to Edmonton to show the doctors their game. We arrive and, and the demo doesn't work and then overnight they, they, they download some builds and you know, it's super stressful and even in the morning it works poorly but for the meeting, magically, it does. And then we come into the meeting and you know, super friendly people, um, not a publisher, nothing like there is no like uh, that will cancel the agreement. It's more again ambition and 
what they will think about us. And you talk to the RPG gods, and and they will rule on your uh, demo if it's good or not. So imagine the amount of stress. Yeah. Yes. Um, and they say they like it. Mm. And uh, we have this. They, they they grant us this corner at their booth, and I'm. I mentioned, I, I said it many times, but I'm really grateful until today about that because this was like putting a Bioware seal of quality on Set and Project Red. Right. Really, honestly, that's what it was because they, they were showing Jade Empire at that time. The first Xbox exclusive Jade Empire. So all the media, like all the IGN's game spots, and we are like, you know, like a, like a tiny little mosquito uh, from Poland. and. Gam was like, oh, Jet Empire, this, Jet Empire, that. And by the way, we have this pretty cool guys here from Poland in the corner, and they have this game called The Witcher. Take a look. And we had all these guys coming in, and they mention us. Um, they write about the game. Incredible stuff. And we sit in this pub with, with, with Greg. He's asking us about the staffing plan. We didn't have HR at all. And, and already we saw that Bioware had like a strong HR. We were wondering, why the hell? Why do they need that? Makes no sense. We can do it ourselves. We were so initially we thought we'll, we'll finish the game. Actually, in the des original design, it was like we'll finish it 20 people or whatever. Yeah, blah blah. But you don't know it. Yeah. People tell you that many times, and you're like, ha, come on, we're Polish, we work harder. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not five times harder, maybe, yeah. you know, one and a half, maybe. Yeah. And he's telling me, you know, Martin, what you see today is just the tip of an iceberg, mm -hmm. and there is a whole huge part of it under underneath the surface and yeah I understood his words probably only a few years later really because we, the Witcher 1 we finished in 80, 80 something. To finish this game said their project were going to have to become a real games development studio, scaling up and working on the project full time. But if they thought the work had been hard up until this point, they had no idea how difficult it was about to get. In our next video we tell the story of how these games were made and reminisce over the developers favourite moments from The Witcher 1 and The Witcher 2. Throughout the rest of this series, we're going to talk to the folks behind the design of the Witcher franchise. We're going to explore the creation of its various worlds, how combat changed throughout the series, things like music, quests, and how the game has been adapted and localized for people all around the world to enjoy it. Hello friends, we're shooting B-roll. There are pigeons and lots of tourists. Way more tourists than the last time I was here. So that's, that's fun. How you doing? I'm getting sunburned again for the second time in two weeks. <laughs>